Okay, sure. Uh, so, so yeah, um, I just wanted to present this uh, paper by some people from the University of Amsterdam uh, called Contrastedly Trained uh, Structured World Models. Um, and uh, this paper I find interesting because uh, it's about world modeling, which is uh, quite an interesting topic for me. And um, to, to first to introduce the paper, I guess uh, I said to learn a world model is to kind of reduce the dimensionality of some uh, environment. And this thing might be useful, for instance, in, in planning for uh, reinforcement learning when you are trying to, to make an agent behave some way uh, in some environment. And another thing that I think makes the paper useful is um, the graph neural network approach, which they uh, try. So basically, they place an inductive bias over the over the environment and say there are some objects, these objects interact together and then learn a representation for each of them uh, individually. And they do that by uh, self-supervised uh, contrastive learning in, in latent space. Uh, so um, to say what, what I mean by that or how, how the environment is presented, uh, well, as I said, the, this kind of representation learning is usually used uh, in RL. So the problem that they have is basically sequential. You have some kind of a static buffer of state action and next state, which they collect by, by random actions. Um, and then they use uh, these observations to kind of learn a state representation in some low dimensional space. So in the upper right hand corner, you can see one of the, one of the simple environments, which is the 2D shapes environment. You have five different shapes and each of them can perform an action of movement and the shape, uh, the, the environment changes depending on whether the shape can inhabit some position. Uh, and the goal here is, as I said, to, to predict uh, a latent space uh, transition. But what makes it interesting and what I said earlier is that they use a graph neural network in order to learn uh, an object factor transition. So you can imagine that each of the individual objects on the scene uh, can have a different transition model and we want to uh, place them in the in the same uh, in the same dimensional space. So uh, if we focus on this on these two graphs, for instance, which are from the directly from the paper, uh, on the left hand side you can see that uh, there are uh, five cubes in the environment, and uh, on, on the left graph shows uh, one of the learned transition models for the orange cube. So uh, all of the all of the orange states represent where the orange cube can move, and uh, what's interesting to note is that the model has actually learned uh, to represent all of the other cubes in the same space, and it has learned that the the orange cube cannot move uh, if another cube is inhabiting uh, the position that it is trying to to go to, and the same happens on the right hand side for the for the uh, green uh, square. So um, to explain how they do that, I think the, the model is conceptually quite simple, yet uh, quite effective. So uh, they first um, state some observation, which is uh, to the uh, image, so a regular uh, image, uh, as, you, as you might get uh, with three channels. Then they place uh, a CNN over this, these raw observations uh, to extract k different filters from the scene. Then each of these k filters, for each of these k filters, we want to uh, imagine that we, we want the model to learn that each of them is an individual object. So in this case, uh, we know that there are five cubes on the scene. There are also five different filters, and we want each of the filters to learn uh, the position of of the object. So then uh, the, these objects are flattened and and uh, encoded using a multilayer perceptron. And then uh, a GNN or a graph neural network is placed over these uh, vector representations um, and learned using a contrastive loss, uh, which basically means that you take uh, a state and action and the next state as a positive example. And then they use hinge loss to, um, to show the, the negative examples. And the goal here is to make the positive examples close to each other and push the negative examples uh, away. Uh, and contrastive learning, I think, is becoming quite a hot topic in ML during the, the recent years uh, in the, with the self -supervised, as the self-supervised uh, approach to, uh, to learning gets more and more uh, popular. 
And so to briefly just go over the results, uh, they evaluate using ranking metrics. So hits at one and MRR, there is no uh, downstream reinforcement learning task. But uh, what they show is that for the simple environments, so for the 2D and 3D shapes that I introduced earlier, uh, this works quite well. It's, it's an easy uh, assignment and, and the, the object factoring works really well. But then they also uh, perform experiments with complex environments and stochastic environments such as uh, Space Invaders and Wong. And in these cases, they do beat the, the, all the self-imposed uh, baselines. Uh, but the, there is no actual interpretability to speak of, so I think the the, uh, the the transitions are not as interpretable as they are in these simple examples. So uh, the, basically, the paper shows that their approach does work, but there is still uh, a lot of uh, room for improvement. For instance, uh, in, in stochastic environments and some uh, similar, more complex uh, environments. And so uh, that's it. I think uh, I don't have much much else to to uh, talk about uh, for for the results and for uh, pretty extensive ablation studies. Uh, I can recommend checking out the paper. And then if you're interested in learning more, um, a, a kind of I guess spiritual successor to this paper is this uh, planable approximations to MDP homomorphisms uh, by the same authors where they. Uh, actually take, I guess, the, the next step. So they use the, the 2D representations uh, to, to actually do planning uh, and, and to learn, uh, to learn uh, a behavior for an agent uh, in, in a reinforcement learning assignment. Um, and also, I mean, if you're interested in this world modeling, I think uh, a very interesting example is in, in this work from David Ha and Jürgen Schmidhuba. Uh, which is on world models and they have kind of they did a similar thing but they did a comp completely neural end-to-end -end approach uh, to learn a world model and also an agent behavior um, in some in some environment um, and yeah that's it I think that's maybe in two weeks if I have if I find the time I will also present this uh, planable approximations paper so if anyone is interested uh, yeah Cool. Thanks, Tony. I think yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, I think you have a like a really um, good good set of like papers that you're looking at at the moment, and they're quite interesting. I remember you did the last time you did a really interesting one as well. Um, thank you. So thanks, thank, thank, thank you for that. I think this is really really um, really nice, and I think very informative for people that want to learn a little bit maybe and you know maybe in interested in a new topic or something because like you said right the contrastive learning and the self supervised learning are really hot topics and in as you expressed which i really find surprising a very simple architecture if we go back to the slide you have a actually have okay. a question on that maybe you can provide yeah very simple architecture yet like you said really powerful right for this particular um task that they're that they're working on um, I'm, I'm quite curious, like the GNN, um, mm. what is what is kind of the, the the main the main things you would say based on what you um, learned from the paper? What, what are the main benefits that you would get from a GNN as compared to something like say an RNN or even something like a transformer, you know, uh, uh, architecture? Yeah, well, I think the the benefits of GNN are mostly, I guess philosophical in nature so uh, I, I'm drawn to the to the to the GNN concept because you can kind of in, induce human bias without explicitly uh, uh, defining right. knowledge so you say there are some objects let's uh, let's learn them and I think that um, yeah I, I think that uh, Thomas Kipp who is one of the the authors of this paper also mm -hmm. did a subsequent work with with an attention model for okay. um, yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I can I can share it maybe uh, in the in the um, Slack later if if I find the paper I can't remember right now, but uh, yeah, uh, the reason why I am interested in this graph neural approach is just for placing a stronger inductive bias and yeah. in theory you can you can get as creative as you want with what the graph nodes can represent, right? Yeah, I totally agree with that. A very simple problem, but yet, like you said, 
um, really simple architecture and it, and it gives you good results, which I find really surprising. Um, but yeah, I'll take a look at that paper as well and see if I can dive a little bit deeper there. I'm really interested in this, this, this whole topic, although my research, is, my research is mostly around NLP, but I'm pretty sure I could learn a few things <laughs> and see if I can adopt some ideas to my research. So I really appreciate your, your effort here. Um, anyone else have any question? Maybe you can ask in the chat or you can, you know, maybe turn on your audio and ask if you like. Anyone? No question. Everything is clear. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, don't be shy. You can ask a question. This is the time. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I have I have more questions just to uh, continue the conversation. Hopefully, we don't spend too much time. But um, I also wanna wanna ask you about you know. <clears throat> so what what would you say are kind of the um, for this particular task? I, I don't know if this task is is you know they focus on one task. Maybe they did a couple more, um, or if this is even generalizable in some sense. And also, I wanna like maybe ask you if you read the paper and, and kind of they, they, they actually mentioned some of the challenges uh, with this work. Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that they noted is this uh, stochastic environment. So in stochastic environments, uh, the, the performance does degrade. And obviously, I mean, most of the real world examples that we have are going to be stochastic. So the, the, the simple uh, examples of this uh, 2D shapes, I mean, it, it's easy to learn because you know that the background is static and so forth. And so I think that um, their approach is uh, basically um, an introduction of this, this entire graph neural network fo focused uh, attempts at, at world modeling. But there is, there is a lot of room for, for improvement. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I, I'm not sure if that answers your questions. Do you, uh, yeah. Should I? Yeah. yeah, that's that's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. All right. So um, let's see. Anyone else has any question that they want to ask and they're curious about? Otherwise, we call it a day. <laughs>